All right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Crypto Cowboy Show. This is the crypto news, crypto information for the last week in January. So welcome, everybody. <laughs> All right, all right, let's get into the news here. First disclaimer, Crypto Cowboy Show and Crypto for the Rest of Us does not provide financial or investment or tax or legal advice. None of this content is that. It's just crypto education, crypto entertainment. So let's get started. All right, let's take a look. What's going on in the crypto market? Well, okay, so anybody knows that last week was a little bit of a rough week for Bitcoin and for most of the crypto market. Now, after peaking around 48K right after the ETF event went live, then slowly things got down and down and down, and we hit roughly 38K early this week. Now, it's rebounded. I think it's 42, 43K today, starting this week. It's January 29th. Uh, but many of the altcoins also plummeted more than 10%. So You've probably heard about this, but let's just let's just get this out of the way about the narrative about what the heck is happening. There's lots of naysayers out there saying that we're in a we're going to go into a bear market again, and uh, you know there's just a lot of selling pressure on Bitcoin. And I think what was interesting about this is that this really wasn't talked about before. I don't know if it wasn't anticipated, but it just wasn't clearly understood. I don't think about what these selling pressures are. So let's cover a few of these you know real quickly. So first, it's pretty clear to everyone now that, again, we underestimated how much of the GBTC, GBTC trust was going to be sold off first. So what we had is you had the, so many people, we had uh, 619,162 Bitcoin that were in the GBTC trust. And a lot of those people wanted to move out into the Bitcoin ETF from the 11 different financial institutions that are going to be offering them now. Now, what was happening was you had Grayscale had the highest fees. So a lot of people were like, hey, I'm out of here. I'm going to go into these cheaper fees, BlackRock, Fidelity. A lot of these were a lot cheaper to get into for, for the B, uh, Bitcoin ETS. And so a lot of that selling pressure. So we just had so much GBT selling that had to happen first, that it was just going to be pushing this price down. So that was the biggest thing. I mean, we roughly had uh, $25 billion. That was how much was in the GBTC trust originally. And we had to get that sold off. So almost $4 billion actually were sold off last couple of weeks. So, But that still leaves around $21 billion that needs to either be liquidated. And we don't think that all of that will be. There's a lot of people that are in the GBTC trust that are in tax-free funds, and if they were to sell, they'd have to incur a lot of that tax expense. So they'll probably leave them in there. So we're not going to have all of that $21 billion have to be sold off. So I don't know. It's probably a couple of more weeks that we might have this. It's going to be up and down. But that's not the only selling pressure. We also had uh, FTX that some of this liquidation that had to be sold out. I think they had $1 billion worth of GBTC tied up in the uh, FTX trial. So that now got dumped. That's out of the system. And that really didn't affect it that much, to tell you the truth. Um, what else do we had? We also had just a lot of leveraged positions that needed to get sold. The market makers were going to grab that leverage if they could. You had greedy investors that were leveraging 100x up on the as the prices went up. And the prices go down, all of those uh, leveraged longs and shorts got cleared out. So now uh, let's see. So I, I think that's about it for now for the for the sell pressures. We'll see. There's some other things behind the scenes that I don't think everyone realized, again, about how these ETFs and the traditional finance gets traded, moved around. You've got over-the-counter trading. You've got multiple-day settlements that happen. So it's going to take a while for this all to shake out. And again, for the mass quantities of financial advisors, people that run the portfolios out there that say that people should be exposed a little bit into Bitcoin, half a percent, one percent, two percent. And if you look at that into trillions of dollars that are out there under management from all these financial investment firms, we're just having massive inflows. We, we, we're just not going to be able to 
uh, even begin to see how much demand is out there for the supply. So this is just another chart that's showing uh, the outflows. And so you see that there's just a whole bunch of that GBTC that had to get unloaded. And you can see the inflows, excuse me, inflows of, of a lot of these different Bitcoin ETFs that were taking quite a bit of inflows. And so we've got, I think, I so iBit was the second one. I'm not, can't remember who, who this, oh, that was Fidelity. And then, then uh, BlackRock, I think, was the second one. And then a bunch of these other guys. So still doing good. It's going to continue to trickle in, trickle in, and we're going to be in good shape in no time at all. All right, so where did all the Bitcoin go? <laughs> you know, it's interesting out there because we've got a situation now where we're going to have all of this demand for Bitcoin. And the supply is shorter than ever. So where, where the heck has it gone? So you can see that there's a big chunk that this is just individuals. You've got individuals out there that are, are hodling, and that's a big chunk. But look at the government. You've got the government that has a bunch of Bitcoin. They have 250,000 Bitcoin. That's a lot. They've talked about selling it. That's going to be another sell pressure. If it happens, we'll see when it happens. China has 190,000 Bitcoin, so they've got a lot locked up. Ukraine has 46,350 Bitcoin, so there's a locked up, lot of locked up there. Look at the loss. You've got two times as much lost Bitcoin as there is Bitcoin held by these governments and these com companies. So again, this was this is people that lost their keys. So again, just it's a great opportunity to be able to hold Bitcoin in crypto in your self custody wallet but you are your own bank and you've got to hold on to your keys. You can't lose that. So double and triple, save those passwords and keys in any way possible in a safety deposit box, in a, 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 a fire and flood retarded bank in your house and maybe even a third copy somewhere else. Because if you've got a lot of Bitcoin, even if you, even if you have one Bitcoin at $43,000, that's significant. You can't lose that. But, this is the opportunity. No one can steal it from you. No one can confiscate it from you. No one can keep you from withdrawing it because it's in your own self custody wallet. So it's a beautiful thing, but you got to hold on to those keys. All right. And Satoshi, that dude is a rich MFer, right? So Satoshi created Bitcoin, had the first wallets. That wallet hasn't moved. It's just sitting there with all this. Bitcoin and what has he got? Forty-four billion. He's got forty-four billion dollars in today's prices of Bitcoin. That that's probably never going to come out. We hope it never does because this is what's made Bitcoin special. So this is just an interesting chart. I thought just to find out like where's all the Bitcoin. But again, the point is, is that there's a lot of hodling going on. People holding their Bitcoin now, waiting for it to get into the hundreds, or maybe they're never going to sell. You know, who knows? But that keeps the supply very limited. And then we're going to hit a halving, a Bitcoin halving again, which then reduces the supply even more that the miners are going to get. And with this demand coming in from all the ETFs, and once the ETFs are out there, and there, a lot of people are knowing about this, I think a lot of people will say that are on the sidelines, that, that don't know one way or the other, they don't have any of their money in a financial advisor or, or whatever, but they're just a little unknown about crypto, they're going to see all these financial advisors, they're going to see all these big big financial institutions that are now are recommending getting into Bitcoin. There's going to be commercials that are going to happen on TV that you can now take out ads on Google to talk about crypto, which you never could before. They always had that illegal. Now those ads are going to be coming out. People are going to start to realize that Bitcoin isn't this scary, crazy you know, internet money that's going to go away or be regulated out of existence. It's just not going to happen now. It's mainstream. It's mainstream, baby. And so with this limited supply and that much of demand, I say it every week, what's going to happen? It's just the laws of physics, right? It's going to go up, baby. All right. So Gary Gensler, this is, this is so funny. I think it was interesting because following the SEC being forced really into offering these spot Bitcoin ETFs. And they were forced because they had to, they lost a trial that uh, they had uh, at XRP and then they had actually with Grayscale. Grayscale sued the SEC because they would deny them actually creating an ETF. 
and the courts said you have no reason to deny them this. So they were pretty much forced into this. So they did this. So you've got uh, somebody on in the SEC, Hester Pierce, who you know she is called crypto mom sometimes, and she her crypto friendly attitude. She said that the agency hopefully will learn from this process and and try to make not make the same mistake again. So this is all about a Bitcoin, excuse me, an ETH ETF, which is now been delayed up until I believe May now to make that decision. But people like Hester Pierce, who is a commissioner of the SEC, is hoping that we don't drag this out again and make this a big crazy deal. Let's just admit that there are a lot of businesses and companies that know they can make a lot of money and a lot of consumers that want exposure to crypto. This gives them a legal, regulated, fairly easy way to do it. Why deny this? So she also says that we shouldn't need a court to tell us that our approach is arbitrary and capricious in order for us to get it right. Having heard from the court that the approach we were taking was wrong, I think the kind of lesson will certainly stick with this. So Pierce's comments are likely to fuel expectations that an Ethereum ETF could follow up Bitcoin. So we have heard that, although it has been delayed. So anyways, I can just see Gary Gensler, you know, getting ready if he wants to have another fight. But uh, I hope that he learned his lesson and that everybody realizes that this is a valuable asset that people want. So we'll, we'll see what happens up there. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit to Elizabeth Warren, the nemesis of crypto. So you've got, you've got some senators and some people in Congress that are pro-crypto. And so you've got Senator Cynthia Loomis from Wyoming, and she's basically rebuffed all these claims from Elizabeth Warren that says that cryptocurrencies are enabling criminals. And she highlights that the scale of the illicit crypto use compared to the U.S. dollar, which you've got 900 million in non-crypto normal fiat money laundering versus 900,000 in crypto. 900 million in regular traditional financial fraud money laundering, 900,000 in crypto. Okay, I why is Elizabeth Warren just going off on this when it's it's a small fraction of what's happening out there already? Why don't they just wor work harder on the bigger number, it just doesn't make any sense to me. So Loomis says, crypto is clearly not the problem. Criminals and bad actors are the problem. It'd be historic mistake to crush this entire emerging industry based on incorrect data. It's, it's not even, well, it's incorrect, but the true data is out there. The, the, the uh, FBI and the CIA have, have also agreed. Crypto is not the way criminals use money anymore because it's traceable. Now, in the early days of crypto, in the early days of Bitcoin, it was. People didn't understand how to use the blockchain to track back to where the criminals were, as they do now. The blockchain that's on, that crypto runs on, is transparent, which means that you can see every transaction. Now, it's synonymous, which means that the names aren't attached, but it's pretty easy for law enforcement to track these transactions and go back and find who these criminals are. You don't have that in, in the fiat currency, so it's harder to track. I get it, and maybe that's why they're doing this, because it's hard to track criminals in normal money, much easier to track them down and capture them in crypto. Why is Elizabeth Warren doing this? Maybe she's... Uh, got some invested interest with some big banks and some traditional financial firms that don't want crypto to replace them. Maybe there's a power thing going on. I don't know, but it's just it just shows that it's dishonest. It's it's not genuine. It it's using false information. Now, if somebody can come out and prove, prove it, like show us that there's way more transactions happening in crypto than there are in fiat, then okay. And there have been some claims that there are ways that criminals are passing crypto back and forth from each other and not allowing you know, non-blockchain. So somehow they're getting it off the blockchain and passing it, okay, but show us that. And also 
if they're on the blockchain at all at any point in time, you can at least trace part of that transaction. So this ought to be figured out instead of just whining about it. Instead of putting more laws in there to try to crush crypto, why don't you just tackle what the really big problem is, which is cracking down the criminals that are in the fiat system? Makes sense to me. I don't know. All right. So crypto that's stolen. So crime, crypto crime is down 54% in, in 2023. The year that, that Elizabeth Warren made the biggest stink about it, it's actually down more than ever. And it's going to go down and down because they're going to get better and better at looking at tools in the blockchain to capture these criminals if they're going to use it. And there's no question that they are using it, just like they're using fiat. They're trying to use any method they can to use their illegal activities. But we've got it down. So stolen cryptocurrency accounted for 34% of all total on-chain transactions in 2023. Uh, and that is compared to 42%, which is $39.6 billion in 2022. So the total funds sent to ad addresses that were illicit or hacks was way down in 2023. So chain analysis, they're this crypto blockchain analysis company that can look at this, and they, they help law enforcement a lot to track down the, the illegal transactions and help law enforcement. So they're, they're noted that they didn't even include the FTX creditor claims, which is $8.7 billion you know, in this figure. So it would have been a lot lot more, but they, they caught this guy. But they didn't use those in the figures, even though that was illegal and illicit funds also. So it's actually even a lower number. They also highlighted that while Bitcoin remains the number one cryptocurrency, it's no longer the number one against scammers who have also turned to stablecoins. So stablecoins are crypto. They are still trying to use crypto to hide from the, from the governments. But it's still much, much less than they are in just normal fiat dollars. So we'll see what happens. So, but here's a statement that she says. She says, I write regarding a troubling new report that your association, so she's talking to this blockchain association, that your association and other crypto interests are flexing a not-so-secret weapon, a small army of former defense, national security, and law enforcement officials to work on your behalf to undermine bipartisan efforts in Congress and the Biden administration to address the role of cryptocurrency in financing Hamas and other terrorist organizations. So she wrote that letter to the Blockchain Association. So we know now that that was an article that was in the Wall Street Journal the Wall Street Journal got false information. They misinterpreted some information from another data collecting uh, enterprise. And that entity, that enterprise came out and said, no, they misinterpreted the numbers. It's not that it's much less. Hardly any went to Hamas. It had been going years ago to Hamas. They realized that, hey, this is going to be much easier to catch us. So they told everybody to stop using crypto to fund their terrorist program. And by last year, there was a couple hundred thousand dollars that they could trace back using crypto. So again, it's not that there isn't any illicit crypto funds happening. It's that it's very small compared to what's happening in, in normal fiat. So it's that kind of, it's that kind of stuff that happens in government that just really, really irks. It irks me. It irks, should irk you because it just basically says that, that they have an agenda, whether the facts are right or wrong or indifferent, they're going to use these, you know, these numbers to twist them in their own way. So if, if I were you, I'd want to take my money out of that system and put it into a system that they can't control. They're trying to, but they really can't. They can never shut Bitcoin down. They're never going to be able to outlaw it all over the world. It's never going to go away. They're trying. They don't want to lose control. They don't want to lose their power, but they're going to try. And if they do it here in the U.S., that's just going to push all this innovation to other countries that get it already. So we'll see. All right. So this is a, uh, yeah, how often do 20% drops happen in crypto? Well, there are certain three certainties in life. You've got death, you've got taxes, and you've got Bitcoin that will have 20% pullback even during the bull market. So kind of a random slide here in the middle, but this is just talking about crypto goes down. If you're selling 
now, then you're panic selling and you don't understand crypto that can drop 20, 30, 40, 70% in the bear markets, but always come back higher. Crypto always comes back higher than it was before. So from 2011 to 2013, 2013, there were 19 corrections of 20% or more. And on average, they happened every 41.5 days. So this, this, is, this is the point here, is that you got to understand crypto. You got to understand that it's very volatile. And if you do, and you understand that it's a mid-range to longer range investment, you'll be fine because it always comes back. It has in the past. It's always come back. There's no reason to, to see that in the future it won't go much, much higher due to all this you know, information that we presented earlier on. So we'll see. So um, again, I'm kind of bouncing around here. So more hacks. So people did lose $2 billion in scams. Now, this is the one area that I really do think crypto has got to grow up because if I'm going to put my money out here and I understand that Bitcoin is a place where the Bitcoin network has never gone down, it's never been hacked, but you've got a whole other area in crypto and DeFi and other tokenization. You've got, you've got metaverse, you've got gaming. These are all areas that have massive potential, especially DeFi, where you can take just about every financial product service in the traditional financial world and now move it into crypto where you have much higher yields because you've got the blockchain and you don't need all these third parties to protect you from the trust. So you, you've got the trust in the code. But one area that, that is still rampant is you've got hackers that can now go into this code and hack it. So if I've got my money sitting in a DeFi yield account where I'm earning 10 to 20 percent yield, that's good to go. I, I use those. But it's possible that where I have that money parked could get hacked. And so this is where we've got to spend more time, I think, in really cracking down. You have more audits. You've got a better code auditing. And if people are afraid to put their money into these DeFi accounts because they can be hacked, then they're not going to adopt it. I get that. So I am calling for much better auditing. And you know, so it's still happening. So we've got to get that out. So this is a call out to the crypto uh, community to let's let's get better auditing out there. You've got this open source code, and this is why it's easy to implement crypto, which is great. People have great ideas. They come up, they innovate, they create new products and services all the time. But if they aren't careful in how they code and they're just throwing it out there without lots of good code editing and making sure they can't be hacked then we're always going to have this problem. So I think it's certainly fixable. They're, we're working on it. It's getting better and better, but it's something that we need to keep working on. All right, so take a look at what's going on in DeFi. So I don't have much, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the yield. So in yield farming, where we can deposit our crypto, so if you've got some Bitcoin or Ethereum and you want to park that, you can trade it into a stable coin or to some of these other cryptos. You park it in some of these DeFi protocol accounts and earn really good high yields. It's one of the areas that I focus on a lot in my crypto investing. And look at the kind of yields that you can get here. So you, so USDC is a stable coin. ETH is a uh, volatile crypto coin. But if you pair those up and you put it in this Uniswap protocol, you can get 27% APY. That's pretty darn good. Can you get that in any bank? Can you get that really anywhere? Unless you're maybe an accredited investor has millions of dollars and you can put it in some special fund with some special bank or trust. But no, that's pretty amazing. All the way up to, and, and this one, you've got AVAX. So you've got uh, Avalanche, which is a really good uh, blockchain. So you got their token. You pair that up with a stable coin and you've got, 206%. So these are the kind of yields that you can generate in yield farming. And it kind of ties in with that last slide, which is there is a risk. It's a small one. And some of these good protocols. Now, a lot of these, uh, you're putting these into Uniswap, been around forever, really good protocol, has really good security. Uh, some of these other ones, Trader Joe, um, these ones have been around there. I trust them to, 
to put my money in there. Some of these, I don't know, most of these have been around. GMX has been around, but I don't know much about Orca or Camino, but you can, you would want to vet them, check them out, see if they've been audited and look at the kind of yields that you can earn. Now, just FYI, they don't stay that long all the time because they're always moving up and down depending on how much other liquidity is in the system and how many transactions are happening. Because basically what's happening here is that you're loaning your money to these protocols, to these DEXs that then have other services and products and services like lending or swapping out different coins. And this is all happening in the crypto ecosystem. And they, they incentivize me to lend me their crypto. Once I do that, now they've got this liquidity to work with. If, if they didn't provide an incentive for me to provide my crypto, my liquidity, their system wouldn't work. They wouldn't have enough liquidity to even run. So it's an ingenious way that crypto basically works, again, peer to peer. It's like I, as a person, am supplying the liquidity that, the, that's going to be used in the system instead of a big bank having to pull it from the government or you know raise capital on their own. This is an ingenious way that crypto in DeFi actually works, and it works great. And so just wanted to point out a little bit of that. So uh, NFT news, let's see, not a lot here today. We've got, um, oh, I just wanted to show some of the NFTs. This is interesting. Uh, I'm not really, I'm not into NFT investing. And uh, I, I, the NFT world is a structural part of, of DeFi and the metaverse and, and a lot of areas in crypto other than the art. Because a lot of games, a lot of utility is basically an NFT, which is just a, 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 an application that is going to track the ownership uh, of whatever you're tokenizing art or a game piece or whatever. And, and it's, it's valuable. It's going to get bigger and bigger. And the crypto industry is going to start using NFTs more and more. You won't really even know, call them NFTs, but they will be these tokenized uh, portions of value that will be used in lots of different areas in crypto. But you still have this art market, and, and it's what helped blow up this word NFT because you had artists and people that were making millions of dollars because they were trading NFTs, which were crypto-based. But you've got Cyberpunk still is, is the OG, and then you've got um, uh, the Yacht Club, Board 8 Yacht Club, they're second there, and then you've got you know the, the, the Pudgies. But remember, so you got, yeah, crypto, crypto punks, which is interesting, the little... Pixelated crypto punks are still the highest value. Now, a lot of these all went way down um, in the bear market. And so a lot of people lost a lot of money when they were trading these. But there still is a lot of value to them. People still love the art. The market will probably come back up. I'm not, a, again, big into NFT, so I'm not sure if if and when and how the market come up, but we'll come back up, but the bull market's coming back up. So I do believe anything in crypto will, will start to go back up and we'll see what happens, particularly in the art world. But I think what's interesting about the NFT world now is that instead of just having a static crypto punk, which might be a, you know, a PFP or a profile picture in your, you know, LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever, um, and sort of flexing that like, hey, look, I've got a crypto punk, I think we're going to move into a lot more utility. So again, you're going to have one of the things that started happening with NFTs is that they could be tickets, if you will, to a concert. So you could buy this NFT ticket and you could have that on your phone and flash that NFT as your entryway into a concert or any sort of event like that. And it also would be proven on the blockchain. So it's like, no one could say, well, that wasn't a valid ticket or so on. So that, there was a lot of utility in that. That's happening more and more in all areas of crypto. And you're going to see, again, gaming really start to proliferate with NFTs as ownership. Now people that play these games can own these tokens and they can sell them. Or I say they are tokens, but they're, they, they're basically uh, like armor or swords or just game pieces, if you will. Again, you can tell I'm not a gamer, uh, really, but uh, I believe in the concept of it. I think it's really going to be valuable. It's going to take a while for the gamers to, to really understand this, but there's, there's millions and millions, maybe even billions of dollars that are spent in these games that in traditional gaming, you can't do anything with, with the assets that you buy. 
When you move that into the blockchain, you can now buy them and then sell them or transfer them to another game. It, so I think it's a really powerful narrative that is just going to get better and better. And I think it's starting to, to happen. All right. So let's end this up with some memes. Oh, this is a meme, but it's also a crazy story. D did you see this where you had apparently this preacher who God said that he should create this coin, this INDX coin, and it basically was a ripoff. And I'm going to play a video here in a minute because you just got to hear this. But basically, these were all the memes that came out. It says, and, and the Lord came to me and said, thou shalt create a Ponzi scheme. <laughs> oh, boy. So listen listen to this video. Let me see. Let me uh, see if you can see this here. Oh, hold on. Da, da, da. Yeah, no, that didn't work. Hold on. And hello there. Yeah. All right. Let me play this. Caitlin and I are being charged in a civil charge uh, from the Colorado Securities and Exchange Commission for basically selling millions of dollars worth of cryptocurrency that is deemed worthless by the state. Now, the reason that they're saying that it's worthless is because there is no exit for people who have bought. Duh. We launched an exchange. The exchange technology failed. Things went downhill. And from that point forward, we've just been, we've just been waiting on the Lord literally for a miracle. So... The charges are that Caitlin and I pocketed $1.3 million, and I just want to come out and say that those uh, charges are true. So there's been $1.3 million that's been taken out of, I think it was a total of $3.4 million. But out of that $1.3, half a million dollars went to the IRS, and a few hundred thousand dollars went to a home remodel that the Lord told us to do. So how this whole thing started is the Lord told us uh, in 21 to walk away from our marketing company, and he said, I'm going to do a new thing. And then he took us into this cryptocurrency. It was a different... All right, so I, I, I can't do it. I can't do it anymore. Um, so, yeah, we're, I don't know. Look at, look at these palms. So, you know, sell me this pen. It's God's. I don't know. These, these, I think these are, these are funny. Oh, hold on. Let me got to get back here. Yeah. So anyways, th that was crazy. I don't know if you heard that story, but you know, there's just, it's just everywhere. But it, this is the first time I think in, that I've seen this in crypto like this, that, the defense was, hey, God tell me to do it. I'm like, that's going to hold up in court? I don't know. Okay, fine. Anyways, let's go over some more memes here. Oh, this was the video. Yeah. Um, so this, these were some memes that were happening last week as crypto was really down, or Bitcoin was certainly down. And so you had memes everywhere that was just like, you know, I, this one, I don't know if I fully understand. You've got the, like the double blind test or something, and one minute you see crypto, it's up, and then the next minute you look and it's gone. So uh, I think that's a... Um, a physics funny or something. <laughs> I don't know. Again, you've got watching my portfolio crash or burn, crash and burn. Uh, when Bitcoin crashes, everyone says they're going to buy the dip and they're like, you still have money? Yeah. Uh, one month ago, B BTC is at 40, BTC is uh, 40K. Today, BTC is at 40K, so it's the sideways. Joe's that, again, these are the pump and dumps. These are the guys that are going to the moon. These are the guys that want it to, you know, they don't get that crypto is a mid to long-term play and that you buy the dip, buy when you're in the bear market and ride it up in, into the bull. It's always gone up higher than it has before. So anyways, that is the show for today. And we've got some funky something here going on uh anyway so have a great week this age we're, we're going to be into february next week we're going to bring all the crypto news and crypto analysis next week on the crypto cowboy show so stay tuned and we'll see you next time <laughs>